tonight, uh, and um, uh, I, I really want to thank everybody for coming. And I, at, at risk of overlooking identifying some of our special guests, I want to start out by saying if you're a member of the host committee for tonight's event, please raise your hand. Many of you. Wow. for the entire year, our 50th anniversary year, the year 2023. Uh, if you are a past board member of Historic Harrisburg, please raise your hand. I said, wow! <laughs> if you're a current board member of Historic Harrisburg, <laughs> great, great, wonderful. And uh, I want to thank you all. Many of you are, are dues-paying members of Historic Harrisburg. If you're not a dues-paying member, and I think almost all of you must be, but if by some chance you're not, there are membership brochures on the table as you leave tonight, and we'd really like to be able to stay in touch with you and have you come to future events and be involved in our organization. And uh, so welcome if this is your first time coming tonight. But this is an unprecedented turnout. Our, uh, our uh, education committee has been putting on these programs fourth Monday of the month for almost 50 years, uh, and they just get better and better. And I want to commend the, the Education Committee for, for planning planning all of this. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Honorable Patty Kim, our state representative, who has a presentation. Patty? Good evening, everyone. Um, it is an honor to be here to congratulate and wish the um, Historic Harrisburg Association a um, happy anniversary. I'm not sure if it's the way I grew up or it's my culture, but the way I was raised, you get from A to B as fastly and cheaply as possible. <laughs> I lived in the suburbs of D.C. in Fairfax County. Bigger was better, newer was better. I come to Harrisburg and I'm on city council and we're talking about windows, <laughs> and they're more expensive. And I'm like, what is going on? We need to get it cheap, and we need to get it done. The Historic Harrisburg Association has taught me a lot. When I'm racing and sprinting to B, I'm learning to pause. Patty, let's look at this. What value does it bring? Jeb and Dave, let's pause. Let's learn the history about these things. I want to keep going though, I want to get there fast. Patty, how can we appreciate this building, this park more? And I think it's a lesson for all of us, not only for Harrisburg, but the way we should live. And I appreciate that you guys have valued being on the board, volunteering and whatnot to advocate for the preservation and knowing the importance of our history and of our city. Largely because of the work of HHA and its civic partners, Harrisburg today stands as a primary example of how historic preservation can contribute to the reversal of decline in American cities. In historic uh, Harrisburg's half century of existence, dozens of multi-million dollar preservation projects and thousands of smaller ones have contributed greatly to the quality of life, economic vitality, and visual attractions of uh, Pennsylvania's capital city. I am so grateful for what you guys have done, have improved our city, brought money in, the economy, and taught us such an important life lesson. So Dave or Jeff, can I just present you this citation? I'm not going to read it, but just uh, 
help that the House of Representatives pause to acknowledge all of your accomplishments and work, um, as well as the board and the co-chairs. And we thank you for your service, and we look for another 50 great years. Oh, that I think characterizes what we're doing. But, you know, cities are made up of people. And the people who live here and the people who have lived here and their history and the physical environment that they left us. So our movement, uh, well, cities also are always reinventing themselves. And uh, but our movement has worked toward preserving the best things in our town in the physical environment, but also we know that we've recognized because of our approach to things that there are some improvements that can be made and sometimes they happen and sometimes they're good. Sometimes. <coughs> Hopefully most of the time. So our movement is made up of friends and members of the association and friends of the city and I think that's been the secret of our 50 years of working for the community. So I'd like to toast Historic Harrison Association, and our members and supporters, and also I'd like to toast our beautiful city on the river. Here. You know, to have half a dozen of our past presidents in the room at once 
I think if we, we should have planned to take a photograph. I think we did that for our 40th. So in any event, too, too much going on tonight. But, but our anniversary year is young. There are going to be more events. So we will, we will plan that uh, in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Jeb Stewart. Uh, Many of you know who he is, and many of you have worked with him or seen him in action. Uh, Jeb is our preservation advisor as well as a longtime member, and uh, if you've got a chance to look at the exhibit out front, uh, or any of the exhibits we've had in recent years, Jeb is usually the, the creator of our exhibits, sometimes with, with other people. For example, Caleb Jackson here worked with Jeb on the exhibit that's out there now, and uh, we're very fortunate to have that expertise available to us uh, for interpreting our history and, and sharing the, the history of our built environment and what it means today. Uh, Jeb is going to be talking to us about the highlights of historic <coughs> preservation over the last 50 years in Harrisburg and how those highlights have really helped to transform the city, as Bob Young just mentioned. So with that, Jeb, I'm going to turn it over to you. Wow, this is an unbelievable turnout to say the least, and we very much appreciate your attendance, especially on a night that might have been uh, so so in terms of weather, so it's turning out to be okay. Um, we want to start with, if I may, um, the first slide What led to the founding of the Star of Harrisburg? Am I to switch? Yes. Thank you. We have to look at Harrisburg in the early 1970s. And there is the beginning of the City Beautiful, or excuse me, uh, Back to the City Movement, City Beautiful, Back to the City Movement, where people were starting to move back into urban neighborhoods like Shy Poke, Midtown. They wanted convenience, they wanted a different, uh, they wanted character in their neighborhood and environment and so forth. And that started to happen. And then lo and behold, the flood hits in 1972. And as many of us may recall, um, the floods did significant damage both in the Shy Folk neighborhood and also in the Midtown, Uptown areas, and, and Front Street in particular. And a, a number of very important landmarks were lost as they were, quote, flood damage, unquote, um, not knowing if they could have been preserved as they may have been today. That was the E.J. Stackpole residence and the 1800 block of North Front Street. Uh, that's kind of next door where Shars and the Tracy Mansion was to the left. That was torn down for a surface parking lot. It was torn down right after the flood. It wasn't torn down in later years. That's one example. Another one was the IH Daftrick residence at Front and Kelker Streets. Flood damage torn down. Redevelopment Authority had created urban renewal districts and went into action in terms of looking at buildings and neighborhoods that should be demolished for, quote, new development or redevelopment. That was another one that was lost. The building that was built in its place was originally the Susquehanna River Basins Commission building, which is now a three-story office building and still in place, obviously, but it was built on that site. Other buildings that we lost at that time, not that they were flood damaged, but they all happened at the same time. The Penn Harris Hotel uh, was demolished in 1973, um, unfortunately, and the State Theater. Uh, was another very important landmark structure, which was demolished in 1974. Uh, so, demolition in 1972, 73, and Shy Poke, other areas of the city, and other landmarks that were lost at the same time. Not flood, but it was this, it was coincidental that they happened at the same time. And what happened was that. Um, there was a, um, a drive to establish municipal historic districts. Uh, Mary Ann Faust, who many of you may recall, was in Midtown, and um, Bill Faust was a director of planning in City Hall. And the marriage of those two kind of worked together well in terms of having the grassroots efforts in Midtown to um, advocate for the establishment of, of municipal historic districts. And Bill Faust, being in City Hall, granting the legislation uh, for that purpose that was brought before city council. I happened to be a summer intern at that time. I hate to admit it. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll just forget that for now, but in respect, in 1974, and I later got a job there in the planning bureau. So I was there at the beginning, 
uh, when the municipal districts were created, the architectural review board was established. I remember being at the organizational meeting of it and so forth. I think I lost a slide here, but I'm not sure. Maybe not. Um, no, there it is. So, historic Harrisburg was on the map literally very early. Um, that was a map showing where the municipal district should be back in 1974. And it took in Chaipook, of course, and it took in the area around the capital and the midtown area. Now, I remember at the time they said, should we go as far north as Burbeck Street? Because we're not sure if the property owners there can live with the kind of regulations that they may not want, but on the other hand, that will protect them in the long run, their properties and their property values. So the decision was made to go to Burbeck Street, and that happened. The legislation uh, was passed, and the review board was established. As you can see, the downtown was not included because the seeds of the Harristown Urban Renewal Plan were in the process of being developed. And this all was happening at the same time. The establishment of the municipal districts, the, the seeds of the Harristown Plan, and uh, there was a comprehensive zoning approach to the city at that time, at least with respect to the issue of uh, historic preservation. So moving on, we want to talk about advocacy. And um, Historic Harrisburg has always been an organization of advocacy. Unlike many other possible organizations, historic organizations that don't have that in their charter. Sorry. <laughs> um, that was, has, has been, and to this day, is very crucial in the fact that HHA can take positions on issues of importance to the community. Uh, what happened after the municipal district was created, the state came in and said, oh, let's overlay part of that with a National Register Historic District, which was done in 1975, which included only up to Forster Street at that time, didn't go as far as Burbank. And that was great. They kind of followed HHA's lead in, in, in the end. Uh, as far as the creation of the historic districts. But then a couple of years later, HHA was very much involved with getting the Midtown uh, area created as a National Register of Historic District, which was done in 1983. I believe that's the year I have on there, yes. And we tried to delineate, of course, from Google Earth, <laughs> uh, the district boundaries. Moving on to a number of very important cases that came before the Architect Review Board um, in the uh, early to mid 1970s. Sure. 1970s. And uh, really, the test was demolition issues. Before, so long as the zoning allowed it, buildings could be demolished, so what? What we tried to do, of course, was to show that, uh uh, we've got historic district legislation now. It's not like it used to be. You have to go before the Architect Review Board, and there has to be a good case for demolition. And this was a, uh, a very early case, two buildings on Pine Street, 125 and 127 Pine Street, that were, uh, that were uh, proposed for demolition for a drive-through for the bank at that time's first federal savings loan on 2nd Street. And uh, HHA and the city went to the mat on that. And it went on for several years, and the city said, no, you can't demolish, it's in a historic district, has architectural features, even though they were in pretty bad shape at that time. It went to county court, and the court upheld the city. That was a very important case at that time because it sent a message. You know, you just can't demolish, you know, as has been done in the past, even though the zoning may allow, have allowed it from a land use standpoint. <coughs> Moving on from that was another critical case. This was at 2nd and Forster Street. BP Oil came in. Wanted to tear down four of those buildings in the northeast corner, <coughs> south, excuse me, southeast corner, for a BP oil station. And um, it went before the review board. The review board said no. City council upheld the review board. <coughs> it went to uh, county court. The court upheld the city. HHA was directly involved in assisting the city in the preparation of the case. And the attorneys said they appealed to Commonwealth Court. But then at the last minute, they pulled out. They tried to get the hell with it. We're done. Another very important case in the early years that HHA was instrumental in assisting with um, that, again, maintained the credibility of the historic district legislation. Moving on from there was the Tracy Mansion. The Redevelopment Authority, the Redevelopment Authority had 
demolished some other properties, as was noted. They wanted to tear down the Tracy Mansion at the time. We got wind of it. I remember this. We got wind of it before the media did. And we splashed it on the front page of the HHA newsletter and got it out to everybody. And the word was out, you know, and there was a groundswell of opposition to it. The redevelopment authority backed off from the Tracy Mansion, thankfully, was saved very much so through the efforts of historic Harrisburg and getting the word out through, as you can see, front page of the newsletter. <laughs> Moving on from there, Telegraph Building. Now, the Pennsylvania Rural Electric Association <coughs> is a theater for its Locust Court building. Oh, they need parking. Okay, all of a sudden they need parking. The Telegraph Building, unfortunately, was vacated at that point. It was on the National Register of Historic <coughs> Places. It was not, unfortunately, in the historic district, but it was on the, uh, national re in the National Register. WHP used to be in that building, and they moved up on Hoffman Street, where they are now. The building became vacant, and the Pennsylvania Rural Electric Association took it under agreement to demolish it. We tried to block it. Historic Harrisburg joined with the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission to go into federal court to try to block it to show that there was a federal undertaking which is part of the environmental review process on National Register properties. And unfortunately, the judge in Commonwealth Court and Williamsport, we went to Williamsport at the time, uh, said, sorry, you know, we can't agree with that. You got the demolition permit, take it down. That was a loss. Unfortunately, it was not in a historic district. The boundary was just a little north of there. But I wanted to show it because this association played a major role with PHMC, joined together officially in the suit to try to block it. Um, one of the positive things was Pancake Row, uh, again, flood damaged properties. The redevelopment authority finally came around and said, okay, we're not going to tear it down anymore. We're going to put properties up for auction in Shycook for the people that want to buy them. Uh, even though they have to have a plan, they have to have financing and so forth to show what they're going to do. HHA bought, bought one of the properties. And it was 112 Canoy Street. And if anyone here, I'm still a little, was it 112 or 110? Bob and Eileen, do you know for sure? <coughs> it's the second one, it's the second one in. The second one in, okay. Um, in any respect, this was an early HHA initiative and being in the, in the de development business. And um, they got the financing, they put a plan together, got the contractors, and they rehabbed the building and sold. And that was done in the, um, in the late in 1978. Um, so that was an early venture from this association in real estate development. <coughs> Moving on from there was the old downtown Harrisburg Commercial Historic District. That was another initiative of the city, I mean of HHA with the city, in creating an additional historic district downtown. The thought was we don't want to see everything in the, in the central business district demolished for new development under the Harristown plan. Something has to be saved. So the municipal, the National Register District was created with the help of HHA. I cheated a little bit and took the rendering from the new um, Harrisburg University building and dropped it in there. <laughs> it's not there now yet. I didn't get on, up on top of Pennsylvania Place to photograph. So I cheated, but thankfully the majority of the, of the district is intact, including the original Keystone building, which is individually on the National Register and has been renovated his apartments, as many of you know. Um, several years after that, Harristown came along and said, we're going to save phase two of the Strawberry Square. Um, originally, it was supposed to be demolished for what is now the Ray, Rachel Carson building at 4th and Market was supposed to be a third in Market. And uh, that was the original plan. And then the state shifted its policy and so forth and said, no, we're going to put it at 4th and Market which then opened up the ability to restore the buildings on Market Street as phase two of Strawberry Square, um, which then enabled the tax credit to bring in equity investors to make the deal happen, which obviously did happen in, in the late 1980s. That was another initiative, again, with the assistance of support of this organization. HHA also later on, or not that much later on, supported the, the creation of additional National Register districts. Um, the concentric circle moving out from Midtown 
and uh, the downtown area. The Mount Pleasant National Register District was created in 1985. The Fox Ridge area was became a federally certified historic district and a municipal district in 1985. The state was originally going to expand into what was called the Capital Extension Area, or whatever it might have been, there was disinvestment <coughs> in the area, and then the governor's policy statement of the early 1980s said, no, we're not going to go there, we're going to lease buildings downtown, and Strawberry Square, 333 Market, that's what made those, helped make those deals work, mm -hmm. and in doing so, freed up Fox Ridge for rehabilitation and renewal, and thankfully, of course, that has happened to this day, with additional protections. As a, as, a, as a historic district. Uh, several years later, Old Uptown became a National Register of Historic District, uh, from Riley up to McClay Street. Um, again, concentric circle moving out as more and more people were coming in, wanting to live here, wanting to rehab their homes, uh, wanting protections, and both the National Register and a municipal district is in place <coughs> at that location. Now this one, of course, was the Senate Hotel. Um, HHA played a big role on this one. <laughs> uh, the Senate came down the Durban Building and, and the Goldsmiths Building for the PNI Tower, okay, Penn National Insurance. The efforts were made to try to save the facade of the Senate Hotel and to bolt it into the new construction, which was really going to be an engineering feat, but it was plausible at the time. And the uh, Pennsylvania National Insurance said, we will grant HHA a facade easement to per in perpetuity maintain and preserve this facade, and lo and behold, it, it was demolished. David may know more about the mechanics of that or the inside discussions about it, but um, it came down. Some say the ball slipped, whatever may have happened. <laughs> but to Penn National Insurance credit, they honored that the value of that preservation <coughs> easement, which was, I think, 125000 David, it was in that range. And that became the seed money for the Community Historic Preservation Fund, which HHA operates to this day. So we can thank Penn National Insurance, sure, sure. even though we lost the building, for giving us that um, initial uh, contribution, to say the least. <laughs> there are a couple of other cases that HHA weighed in on. Uh, there was a proposal to build a hotel at 2nd and State Streets. I think it was 2007, 2008 in that range. And uh, thinking, no, no. It violated all the zoning. It violated the height restrictions. The intent was to keep the zoning lower above Pine Street. No height restrictions south for intense development in the Central Business District. To keep the, the zoning lower scale to protect the neighborhood around the Capitol, the Capitol building itself. That was proposed, and it didn't happen, obviously. And what happened instead was the building that's there in its place. HHA took, took a hard position on that at the time it was proposed. Another one that we'll, many of us will remember are the properties in the 2900 block of North Front Street that Mary Kay had. Um, the Gross Mansion on the corner, which is the Bryce's have now, and then of course the central building, the one that's off the Mary Sachs house, he couldn't get all three of them, which is now the bed and breakfast. HHA went to the mat on this one, <laughs> along with other organizations. In fact, I remember there were pickets on Front Street, signs marching up and down, save, <laughs> save the buildings. And some of us may have been there. In fact, it was on the front page of the Patriot News with a bunch of us picketing, and my picture was there, and I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> And I had a relationship with Steve Reed at the time, and uh, I won't go any further with it. But the point is, is that, <laughs> the point is, is that as we all know, uh, through intensive lobbying efforts, and the Academy Manor neighborhood too, for that matter, um, they all backed off. The buildings were saved. They said, oh no, they're flood damaged, they have to come down, and now there's mildew, all this stuff. No. <laughs> they were saved, and they're brilliant to this day. Uh, and another one, uh, of course, the uh, Baker Mansion. Robert Hall, remember that? <laughs> um, which became, which the United Way wanted to tear down 
Force new headquarters. And that was uh, when that was 2000. And HHA again went to action, lobbied against it. Um, and they said, okay, all right, all right, we're tired of this. We're going to move to the West Shore. We're going to abandon our plans. We're not going to build our building. And thankfully, the building is still <coughs> paying the milestone uh, in on the river and is now the Dilks, um, Dilks property of Harrisburg headquarters. And that's Derek Dilks. That's his operation up there now. This is wonderful what happened here. Um, the Pennsylvania Housing Buy. Uh, yeah, Housing Finance Agency wanted to tear down the Hickok Mansion in the corner of Front and Locust, and two buildings on Lo houses on Locust Street just behind uh, for the expansion of their building. And HHA, again, went into action. Can't we do anything to save this, save the Hickok Mansion, save these two buildings that were built circa 1800, very, very old buildings in Harrisburg, have homes in Harrisburg, and also uh, the neighborhood group too was involved. And it was a very creative approach. The, the back of the, uh, the Hickok Mansion had a 1950s edition on it. We said, take down the 1950s edition. That it doesn't relate to the building at all. They got enough lot coverage by tearing down the, the back of that building in order to build the expansion, as you can see now, um, on that land and integrate <coughs> the Hickok Mansion into their complex and also saved the two buildings on Locust Street, which have since been sold. A very successful preservation case, where you have the marriage of new development, new construction, and historic preservation together. Everybody was satisfied, everybody won. So this, uh, and HHA, again, played a very prominent role uh, in that process. State Hospital. The, the saga continues. <laughs> uh, still owned by the Commonwealth. I don't know if anybody's here from the Commonwealth who can give us an update. Um, what we are uh, most concerned with is the historic campus. Um, the historic campus, which is, you know, very Ivy League looking and so forth, and could be put to many cool uses as opposed to demolished uh, and reused for new development. The areas to the rear. Um, was was the, the, the state office buildings in, in, the, in the back part, the eastern part of the, of the state hospital complex, and they're slowly being vacated. We still don't know what's going to happen here. There was a deal that they were going to sell to the redevelopment, Dauphin County Redevelopment Authority, and apparently that deal is either not going to happen or it's on hold. So we don't know where the Commonwealth is going with the state hospital. It is a National Register Historic District unto itself. And uh, with that, of course, comes incentives and environmental protection. And um, we'll see. We have to watch this one closely to see where it's going. Yeah. Um, another one that HHA took a strong position with was the four Methodist churches several years ago. But the Methodist conference wanted to close um, for one reason or another. One was um, Camp Curtin on 6th Street, Grace Methodist. Uh, the one on Bow Street, which is a very small church, which actually the congregation is kind of going by the wayside there anyway, and then the one out on Berry Street. Our concern was these are active congregations. We didn't want to see the buildings closed, because if they did, they might become vacant, and then they may deteriorate, and they were all, all important structures. So as it turned out, several meetings of the Methodist Conference, which uh, were <laughs> exciting to say the least. Um, <laughs> And working with the congregation at Grace Methodist, uh, Grace Methodist came up with a plan to sustain the congregation, to sustain the church for the future. Methodist Conference backed off. <coughs> Robert, I hope I'm right about this. You are correct. And uh, the church for now is saved, as it should be, the historic landmark that it is. I mean, the fact, just the notion of closing that church is something that we couldn't even fathom. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Camp Curtin, individually listed on the National Register, the congregation voted to close, uh, which they did. The church has been purchased, um, and we'll see where that goes. Bow Street, the church on Bow Street, I think is being converted to residential uh, by Derek Dilks, I believe. And the one on Derek Street has another congregation. So that, that building is saved and will be maintained. So 
That's where we are with the church. On the right, HHA took a position with PennDOT. There's a utility bridge that's being proposed to parallel the Market Street Bridge. I don't know if some of you know about this. There's been some um, media about it. They can't get, they can't put all the new utilities in the Market Street Bridge because of the concrete, the way it's structured. They have to run all new utilities because they're going to refurbish the Market Street Bridge. And doing so, they want to run new utility lines. They want to put it on a temporary, no, excuse me, a permanent bridge just to the south, which you can kind of see a little bit of in the upper right. We were, HHA was invited by PennDOT to comment, which HHA has done, and issued official comments to, to uh, PennDOT about how the bridge should appear in terms of being more transparent, not as glaring in terms of its materials, uh, that the um, piers be uh, structured in a way that has a little bit of an embellishment that ties to the piers in the Market Street Bridge. So it looks like the best that can be done in terms of making this bridge more transparent and blend in more with the Market Street Bridge, even though I don't think any of us are pleased to have this, this permanent steel utility bridge erected to the south of the Market Street Bridge. <coughs> this is still in the planning process at, Pen at PennDOT, and we still need to be uh, cognizant of where this goes. Now, we want to mention going on to things, other things that the association can do, of course, is the annual preservation priority list. And that's where we want to draw attention to buildings and sites whose, whose futures are unknown or are threatened or maybe development opportunities. And we've been doing this every year for X number of years. And this is just two uh, layouts uh, from 2019 and 2020 of some of the buildings that we have on our list. And there are about 40 of them. And they, they have been published before, and they'll be published um, in our upcoming spring newsletter. The list will be published. So it's just something that we want everybody, obviously, to remain aware of. Now we want to get to this building. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <if> we may. <laughs> um, HHA, of course, received this building as a donation from the Pennsylvania National Bank and Trust Company uh, in 1993. So we've been here that long, and there was a lot of sweat equity that went into this building when, once it was received by the bank. They had moved on and didn't need it anymore. And, one of the, and so we wanted to include, just to show, how this building has historically played a role at this key intersection with the Broad Street Market. This is a 1910 postcard, postcard showing the building and the market and Third Street, and the same same shot today. Uh, changes on the left, of course, it's commercial and now it's residential. The building had a fire in 1911, and the front of it was rebuilt. So if you see it, there might be a difference in the architecture here versus here. It was for that reason. but. It's a cool building, it's brownstone, um, has a lot of character, and we have a lot more work to do here, as you may know, in terms of the restoration of the skylight and other things that will be a subject of discussion more so in the future. So when we got the building, had a drop ceiling. Um, as many banks did, they took historic structures of putting drop ceilings for HVAC and so forth. One of the first ones was tear out that drop ceiling. A lot of sweat equity, a lot of people, in fact, a lot of people are probably here, helped in taking that drop ceiling out, painting, doing the best they could with the, the banking hall, which is really quite stunning, even though more has to be done. This room had a lot of work done to it also, as well as the one on the second floor. So we just want to note the fact that this building has been used very well uh, since 1993 for many things, like such as now, many special events, exhibits, uh, community gatherings and so forth. So we want to touch a little bit on the building without going into too much detail. As far as exhibits, there have been a number that have been done um, over the years. Uh, one was done to the tribute to the Broad Street Market that the association did. Another one was to uh, architect Clayton Lapley in 2016. Uh, these were exhibits that were uh, on display out here and, and, and other places. Um, uh, HHA was just recently um, did a, a, an exhibit on the 50th anniversary of the Agnes Flood. That was last year, not this year. So 22, Agnes Flood 23, 
50th anniversary here. Um, also, in 2016, the city approached HHA and said, will you do a 100th anniversary for Pocona? Uh, an exhibit on celebrating the 100th anniversary of Pocona, which was founded in 1916. We did it. Uh, now we do, we do an exhibit, but we took the exhibit and put it on the bridge. And um, for a day or two, which is really cool, during the height of Pocona, HNJ took the exhibit from here and we fastened it onto the Wall Street Bridge, which was really remarkable. Because people could see the river, they could see the activity of 1916, and then compare that to the activity of today. And uh, we also did uh, an extensive exhibit on the City Beautiful Movement, um, and which we have here. Uh, that can be uh, shown at any time. And uh, because that was another uh, monumental uh, milestone for the city in the early 20th century. The governor's mansion asked that, that we do an exhibit on the history of governor's residences in Pennsylvania, not necessarily the governor's mansion or the earlier governor's mansion, the one that preceded that, but where they lived. Where were their homes in the Commonwealth other than Governor's Mansions in Harrisburg, whether it be um, Governor Snyder up in Seelands Grove, uh, whether it be a uh, gentleman from, uh, that was up in Pike County, I can't remember. Um, the Governor Robert Pinchot. Pinchot, thank you very much. Pinchot's home up in, in um, uh, Milford, uh, and a number of others for that matter, up in Belfont, where, where there was so. That exhibit, hung in the governor's mansion for several years. We thought they were going to take it down. They didn't. I don't think it's there now, but it was there for several years. HHA did the exhibit. And another one that was done more recently was a salute to downtown retail that emphasized Mary Sachs and the Mary Sachs legacy uh, as being a retailer and her, her store and so forth, but other retailers downtown in the 40s and 50s and 60s. That was another exhibit that we did. We have all the panels. We have the PowerPoint. It can be seen. It can be viewed at any time. Um, so that was another major effort that the association accomplished. Uh, and then the one that David mentioned earlier that Caleb and I worked on was the Hidden African American Heritage <laughs> Exhibit, which is out currently uh, in the banking hall um, that traced uh, what happened to the old eighth ward and the lower seventh ward, where Jackson Lake Apartments, the townhouse, that was all blown out. That was they were neighborhoods that were blown out under the urban renewal activities activities of the 1960s, and of course the eighth ward was blown out by the initiative by the state government that had to expand the capital complex. So there's a lot out there in terms of mapping um, some of the landmarks. African American, primarily landmarks, barber shops, hotels, restaurants, other facilities, uh, institutions that were wiped out uh, through through that clearance process. So we wanted that, of course, to be uh, something that we uh, highlighted and wanted to remember. And we threw this in just to show that uh, HHA puts their things out on the teller lines, as the one it is now. And the other ones I've talked about before have also been on the teller lines. <coughs> Moving along, we want to talk about, of course, <coughs> house tours. After, in 1973, the first thing the organization did was to get a house tour, establish a house tour, which was the first year in 1973. And the intent was to bring attention to homes in Harrisburg. It's a great place to live. The flood happened. That's over with. <laughs> and we want to move ahead the future in terms of historic preservation and showing how wonderful the city is as a, as a residential uh, location. First house tour booklet, 1973, but it's current house tour booklet, 19, or 2022. Also the garden tour, uh, which has been reinstituted. Um, one was done uh, last year and the year before, and we intend to do another one. So the intent is to get the, the garden tour back and up again and moving, as we have with the house tours for that matter. And also the outdoor history system. There are 113 of these outdoor exhibits citywide, 
that when they were first installed about 20 years ago. And over time, some of them have deteriorated. They've been uh, missing, uh, whatever may have happened. HHA worked with the city to get a gaming grant, which HHA got, with actually the Midtown Action Council, to refurbish some of the ones that have been missing <coughs> or uh, have been damaged, and also expanded the system to, to include new ones. And new ones included the, um, uh, well, the, the celebration of the uh, 50th anniversary of the flood, which was installed in Front Park and Shock Folk, the Mary Sachs uh, shop on Third Street, um, what do I have up here? Oh, uh, Jackson Square, where unfortunately the, the uh, Jackson House collapsed. We'll see we're, what we can do in the future there, but we wanted to honor that area. Uh, the Susquehanna Art Museum, that one's going up shortly. The Midtown Historic District as an entity, that's at the corner of Third and Forster by the State Museum at a gateway to Midtown. And then the Mary Sachs Residence, which was the one that I one of the three on Front Street that was saved. And also, HHA partnered with the YWCA in 2016 to do the Race Against Racism. And this was a new thing. Uh, YWCA has done this every year. The intent was, let's not do Riverfront Park and say, uh, let's do something different. And the intent was to go up 7th Street and down 6th Street and try to look at key areas along those two corridors that had African-American significance in terms of places. Again, this is kind of a forerunner to the exhibit we did um, on the Senate Ward. And it was very successful. And we had placards. In fact, this is one of them here. And they were installed during the race. So the people that participated could walk it. They weren't running it. And could see For you some of these destinations and locations. And they're all listed here. Caleb Jackson was instrumental in helping us with that likewise. And wa uh, walking tours. And this is something that's ongoing. And David uh, is instrumental in conducting most of these tours. Uh, we have the, the Capitol area, the Capitol complex. We have walking tours of Old Uptown. We have walking tours of Allison Hill. And these are um, flyers that can be handed out. And we also have a Civil War Trails tour uh, showing destinations in Harrisburg that were important during the Civil War, one way or the other. All cool stuff. Elegant progressions. We don't want to miss that. Started in 1992, just had the 30th anniversary uh, last year. This is the first program of Elegant Progressions in 1992. And upper, upper right hand corner is the most recent program from last year. Ongoing for 30 years is the organization in partnership with the Kidney Foundation uh, of Central Pennsylvania has been able to maintain and advance and through the participation of so many people and so many people in this room has been a successful event and it's been a good fundraiser for both organizations. And what we have, oh yeah, the, um, preservation awards and toast events every year that we do. Uh, we've done for a number of years, but we just want to include a couple of samples did one I toast at uh, Midtown in um, 2015. Did a toast to Harrisburg's West Shore, which was interesting, uh, last year. Did a toast to Peggy Grove, who she's been a, a big supporter of the organization. And also a toast to Caleb Jackson in Jackson Square a couple years ago. There have been others, but we just wanted to highlight the fact that these, been done, these have been done, and we'll continue to do so. Where is Mr. Cordier? <laughs> <laughs> who helped us with an auction uh, back in 2014. Um, that's when a lot of folks brought their stuff here. Uh, Courier Auction sold it for us, uh, which we appreciated. We'd like to do it again, but it was an important milestone in our history and we wanted to uh, at least highlight it and mention it. And the Speakeasy event uh, was held uh, in um, 2017, uh, which was cool. That was different. Uh, there may be other cool things like that, but that will happen here again, but that was uh, important at the time, and wanted to mention that that was another special event. Lectures, communications, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to note the fact that this is an ongoing Monday uh, event, first <coughs> uh, Monday lecture series, and more recently we've been doing it on Zoom for obvious reasons. We've been blending Zoom with in-person. One time we did a Zoom and we didn't have too many people, so they're all doing it 
by Zoom. So we're hoping to get back to more in-person events because it's <coughs> critical in our belief. And the newsletter. HHA newsletter was first, uh, the HHA newsletter was first published uh, in April or May of 1973. And it's been published ever since. A original newsletter in 1973, most recent newsletter last fall. Mm -hmm. And lastly, we want to talk about the Community Historic Preservation Fund. One thing that it does is maintain the plantings in Swenson Plaza, which is great, but there are other worthy projects that have come before the fund uh, for support in the past. And I didn't want to get into that because there's just too many of them. Uh, but, but they're having grants that have been issued by the fund for <coughs> relatively small projects, uh, the projects that have helped other organizations have achieved. The church needs some painting done, uh, or a steeple needs some work done to its mortar, one way or the other, without a major remake. remake. Uh, the fund can help on smaller projects, but we, we're continuing to grow the fund, and we'll see where it goes in the future. And again, that was the fund that Pennsylvania National Insurance helped us with, going all the way back to the Senate Hotel. So with that said, we want to honor those that participated in the 20th anniversary in 1993. And these are folks that were uh, volunteers, board members at that time that sat for a photograph. I don't want to go through some, some of them, unfortunately, are no longer with us. Others uh, are. <laughs> and then on the right, 10 years ago, when we had the 40th anniversary, um, the presidents, past presidents of the organization that were there, uh, stood for a photograph. So we wanted to conclude this by showing uh, some of them were involved then and at that point. So that's kind of where we are with all this. And I'm going to end this now. And if anyone has any questions or anything to add, if I missed anything, um, please speak up. audience and now we have a cake that we're going to cut now I hope everybody will stick around for a piece of birthday cake maybe get another glass of champagne I'm sorry for those of you who had to, had to stand up but uh, this is a, a symptom of our success so thank you again everybody for coming